Okay, today I'm going to be solving the engineering admissions assessment for the University of Cambridge. This is the section one paper from 2017. You get 80 minutes to complete this paper. Uh, it's split into two sections, a part A, a part B, um, part B being a bit harder than part A, and there are no calculators allowed for this paper, so I'll be solving some of the calculation on the page here. Okay, without further ado, uh, this is the first question. We've got to evaluate this, this expression. Um, so the first thing to realize is that root 12 can be split into root 4 multiplied by root 3, or just 2 root 3. So 2 root 3 plus root 3 is 3 root 3 on the top. And on the bottom, 2 root 3 take away root 3 is just root 3. So when we square this fraction, we can just cancel it down to actually 3 over 1. So 3 over 1 squared is just 9. So the answer is F. Question 2. A car is traveling along a horizontal road um, in a straight line. This is the velocity time graph for part of the car's journey. During this part of the journey, what is the total distance traveled uh, while the car is decelerating? So the gradient of the line gives the acceleration. So only in this section here is that gradient negative, so the car is decelerating. Now, the area under this part of the curve will get the distance traveled. You can see that this shape is actually a trapezium, so you could use the formula for the area of a trapezium to work out this distance traveled. But what might be a bit easier is just to consider one of these squares well, one of these squares is 10 seconds times 5 meters per second, so it represents 50 meters. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 2 halves make 10. There are 10 of those squares underneath the curve here, so 10 times 50 meters is 500 meters. So the option is B. Moving on, question three, solve the inequality. This is a quadratic inequality, so I'm gonna move all of the terms over to the left-hand side. So we're gonna end up with two x squared plus x minus 15 is greater than or equal to zero. Now I'm gonna call this quadratic the function f of x, and I'm gonna plot that function against x. So if we do that, we get something that will look like this and the curve will probably dip below the x-axis um, and it has this u-type shape because this is a positive quadratic. So that's f of x plotted against x. So the question is where is this curve greater than or equal to zero? So that will be where the curve is above the x-axis um, or, or equal to it, which is this region here and this region on the other side here. So we need, we need to find these two roots of the equation to find out where this function is greater than or equal to zero. So to find the two roots, I'm going to multiply the first number by the last number. That gives me minus 30. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give minus 30 and add to give just one. So those two numbers are 6 and minus 5. And if you want to find the solutions to two equation, to a quadratic equation very quickly, you can take the negative of these two values, so that would be minus 6 and 5, and then divide by the first uh, number in the quadratic, so divide by 2. So the solutions will be minus 3 and 5 over 2, which is 2.5. So this one will be the minus 3 root, and this will be the 2.5 root. So I'm looking for x is greater than or equal to 2.5, and x is less than or equal to minus 3, and that is option E. Okay. So question 4. When a source pan of water is heated from below, convection currents form and transfer heat through the liquid. Here are three statements about uh, the water as it is heated. So convection currents arise because the density of the water decreases. Um, and so the water that is heated just at the bottom of the pan 
will be the lowest density and rise to the top where it will cool and then decrease in density and sink again. So overall the density is, is decreasing in the water. So the density is given by the mass over volume. Now the mass of the water won't be changing uh, unless some of it evaporates from the top. Um, but the density will still go down and that is because the volume of the water goes up. As the water molecules vibrate faster, the distance between the molecules increases, increasing the volume. So when we look at these statements, the mass of a fixed volume of water increases. That's not true. And the density of a fixed volume of water decreases. That is true. And the reason for that is that the volume of a fixed mass of water increases. So that is also true. Um, so the answer is G, 2 and 3 only. Okay. The equation gives Y in terms of X. Which of the following is a rearrangement for X in terms of Y? So what I'm going to do is plus 5 to both sides first. I'm not going to write the X side. Um, then I'll divide by 3. That'll just leave me with the brackets and the square. So I would then square root, taking a plus and minus. And that would just leave me with X over 2 minus 1. So I'd have to add 1 and then multiply the whole thing by 2. Um, and if we expanded this bracket, it would give 2 plus or minus 2 times the square root. So the option B is the answer here. OK. So 6. An electric motor is used to pull a broken down car slowly from the road up a ramp onto the back of a breakdown truck. The car has a mass of 1,200 kilograms and is lifted for a vertical height of one meter. The total input energy is 28 kilojoules and its efficiency is 75%. In the process of lifting the car, energy is lost to the surroundings from the motor and from other causes. What is the total energy lost to the surroundings? So I think what we need to work out here is the total useful energy output. And the only thing that you're really trying to do is move this car up one meter so the energy output that is useful is a gravitational potential energy increase. So we can use mgh to calculate this, this useful energy output. So the mass is 1200. It is multiplied by the gravitational field strength, which we're taking as 10 here, multiplied by the height, which is 1. So that will give me 12,000 joules or 12 kilojoules. And I don't think I need this 75% efficiency because I know the total energy input is 28 kilojoules. I know my total useful energy output is 12 kilojoules. If I just take away 12 from 28, that will be the energy output that was sort of wasted on other things. So it will be 16. OK, let's move on. A fruit stall sells apples costing X pounds each and pears costing Y pounds each. Sam bought two apples and five pears. The total cost of these was P pounds. So I can write an equation for that. 2X plus 5Y equals P. And Leslie bought three apples and two pears and the total cost of these was Q pounds. So three apples and two pears equals Q pounds. So I'm going to call this equation 1. And this is equation two. So if I want to find an expression for the cost in pounds of a pair, I'm looking to find y. So I want to eliminate x. And the way I might do that is by multiplying equation one by three and equation two by two. And then both of them will have a six x and I can take one away from the other. So let's do that. And um, so the first equation multiplied by three will give six x plus 15y is equal to 3p, call that equation 3. The next equation multiplied by 2 will be 6x plus 4y is equal to 2q, let's call that equation 4. So 15y is greater than 4y, so I'll take equation 4 away from equation 3, and that will leave me with 11y is equal to 3p minus 2q. 
and then I just need to divide that by 11 to give my formula for y, uh, and that option is g, so g is the right answer here. Okay. In one type of medical scanner, a source is placed inside a patient's body. This source causes pairs of gamma rays to be emitted simultaneously in opposite directions. Detectors on each side of the patient are used to detect the gamma rays. The distance between the two detectors is 3 meters. When a source is at Q, halfway between the detectors, the two gamma rays arrive simultaneously. In a particular scan, the gamma rays arrive at the two detectors with a time difference of 4 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. Assume that inside the patient, the gamma rays travel at the speed of light. How far from Q, halfway between the detectors, is the gamma ray source? So we need a quick drawing of this. So let's make this D1 the detector 1. I'm going to do D2 over here. That's the second detector. Let's put Q in the middle. Let's say that you're emitting from P, and those are those two points are a distance x apart. Okay. Then this distance here is 1.5 meters. And so is this distance here. Okay, so I'm going to use T1 to be the time since the uh, gamma ray is emitted at P for it to be detected at D1. Okay, so that time, we can just use distance over speed is time. And the distance that's going to travel from P to D1 is 1.5 minus x. So we can write this as 1.5 minus x over c, the speed of light. And we can do the same thing for the time t2. That's just going to be 1.5 plus x divided by the speed of light. And then we can use t2 minus t1 as our time difference. So it's going to take longer to get to detector 2 than it is to get to detector 1. So t2 minus t1 is our time difference. So if I multiply both of these equations by c, it might be a little bit easier. So let's use c t2 minus t1. That is going to be equal to 1.5 plus x take away 1.5 minus x. So that's just going to give us 2x. The 1.5s will cancel. So if we want x, we just need to work out c times the time difference, t2 minus t1, divided by 2. So that's going to be 3 times 10 to the 8 times 4 times 10 to the minus 10 divided by 2. So if you do the 3 times 4 bit divided by 2, that's just 6. And considering the powers of 10 here now, we had 10 to the 8 multiplied by 10 to the minus 10, so that's going to be 6 times 10 to the minus 2 in meters. So 10 to the minus 2 in meters is centimeters. This should be 6 centimeters, which is option D. OK, good. So 9, question 9, P is directly proportional to Q squared. OK, that's nice. We can write that as P is K Q squared for some K. When P is 2, Q is 4. So 2 is equal to K times 4 squared, which is 16. That means that k must be 1 eighth. OK, so q is inversely proportional to r. Right? We can write another equation for that. Let's use capital K uh, divided by r. When q is 2, r is 5. So 2 is equal to big K over 5. So big K is just equal to 10. OK, so what do we have to do now? Uh, what is P in terms of R? So I can rewrite this as Q equals 10 over R. But P is in terms of Q squared. So let's find out what Q squared is. Q squared, that's going to give an R squared on the bottom. And 10 squared is 100. So I'm going to turn that into a 100 there. And we're going to multiply this by K, which is 1 eighth. So we need q squared over 8, that, that is equal to p, and we need to divide by 8 here as well. Now 100 divides by 8, um, that would be 12.5, 1 
Or let's actually just divide by four on the top and bottom because they're probably they're going to want it as a as a simplified fraction. That will be twenty five over two r squared, and that is option E here. Okay. So when a plutonium two thirty nine nucleus absorbs a neutron, it undergoes nuclear fission. One particular fission reaction results in the creation of xenon and zincronium as daughter nuclei. The nuclear equation for this reaction is shown, but with some of the non-zero integers replaced with the letters W, X, Y, and Z. Which equation is correct? Okay, so we're just going to be conserving mass number and proton number. Um, so if we conserve the mass number first, we can see that there's uh, 1 from the neutron and 239 from the plutonium, so that's 240. And that has got to be equal to the mass numbers on the other side, which is W plus Y plus Z times 1, which is just Z. And if I look, I can see that B is exactly the same as that. If you just take away W plus Y, then you get that expression in B. So B is the answer here. That is an equation that is, a, is correct. So if we want to just check, we can check what the proton uh, what the proton number um, equation looks like. We can see that it's 94 on the left-hand side, and that has to be equal to 54 plus x. There are no protons in the, in the neutron part here. So x is just 40, so that's not really an equation at all. And that kind of rules out a lot of these equations, d, e, f. So the answer is b. Okay, question 11, which of the following is a simplification of this expression here? So you could put everything um, into one fraction, um, but that would complicate this quite a bit. So instead, I'm just going to deal with the fraction on the right here. Firstly, the x squared can cancel with the x cubed, just to have an x on the bottom. And then if we look at the 9x squared minus 4, well, that screams to me difference of two squares. So that's 3x minus 2 multiplied by 3x plus 2, all divided by x 2 minus 3x. OK, 3x minus 2 and 2 minus 3x, well, they're just the negative of one another. So if I cancel out the top, and the bottom, that just gives me an extra minus sign, which will cancel with my minus sign in the question. So I know I'm going to end up with 2 plus 3x plus 2 over x. 3x over x is just 3, so we end up with 2 plus 3 plus 2 over x, which is 5 plus 2 over x, which is d. OK, so that's simplified quite nicely. Question 12, an electric motor is connected to a constant 12 volt DC supply. The motor is used to lift a mass of 20 kilograms by means of a rope and pulley. The mass is lifted vertically through a height of 6 meters in a time of 5 seconds. The complete lifting system, motor, rope and pulley is 80% efficient. What is the current in the electric motor? OK, so we need to compute the power output here. and we know that the energy change is actually an increase in gravitational potential energy. So that increase in gravitational potential energy is just mgh, which is equal to 20 kilograms times 10, which is our gravitational field strength, times 6. So that's going to be equal to 12, uh, 1,200 joules. Now, we want this as a power, though, really, so we should divide by the time it takes to work out the power. And the time it takes is 5 seconds. So if I'm doing 1,200 divided by 5, I can divide by 10 and times by 2, which is going to give me 240 watts. OK, but we're really interested in the power input now. Now, the power input, we know that... 20% of that is wasted to give this 240 um, watt output. So what we can do is we can say that 240 
watts would be 80%. So if we divide that by 0 0.8 or divide it by 4 over 5, we would get our power input. Okay. So if you're confused about the way around that you do this, just think it has to be bigger because I'm wasting some of the energy. So if I'm dividing by 4 over 5, it's really the same as dividing by 4 and timesing by 5. So 240 divided by 4 is 60. 60 times 5 is 300. So we have a 300 watt uh, supply power. Okay, And we can use the equation power equals current times voltage to, to work out the current here. So our power is 300 and our voltage is 12 volts. So 300 divided by 12, I can do 300 divided by 3, then divided by 4. So that's just 100 divided by 4, which is 25 amps for my current. So the answer is F. OK. Uh, what is the value of x that makes the following expression correct? OK, so everything here is some sort of power of 2. So I'm just going to ignore the 2 to the power of and just consider 4 as 2 squared and 8 as 2 cubed and root 2 is going to be 2 to the half. So I can write it as 3 plus 2x uh, and then it's going to be added to 2 times x, so 2x, and then that's going to be added to 3 times minus x, so that would be a minus 3x. And on the other side, so I'm just adding all of the powers here because these are all being multiplied together. On the other side, I have 4, which is 2 squared, and root 2, which is 2 to the half. So that gives me 2 to the 2.5 when I add them together. Um, so I'm going to write that as 2.5. So if I add the x powers here, then we end up with 3 plus x is equal to 2.5. So x must be minus a half, or minus 0.5. So that's D. OK, question 14. The nucleotide uh, X, which has a mass number of P and a proton number of Q, decays to a stable nucleotide Y. During this process, four particles are emitted, an alpha particle and three beta particles. Which of the following is not a nucleotide that could be formed at any stage, any stage during this process? So. Crucially, they haven't told us the order that these are admitted in. So they haven't told us whether it's alpha, beta, 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 or beta, 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 alpha. It, you know, so you have to just think which of these is possible. So if I did my three beta decays first, then my atomic number would go up by one each time because a beta emission is when a neutron in the nucleus turns into a proton and you admit a beta particle, which is just a high-speed electron. So these three options here, B, C, and D, are all possible. So we rule them out because this is just one beta emitted, two betas emitted, then three betas emitted. But option A is definitely not possible because your proton number can't go down by one um, if, if the proton number goes down at all, then you're emitting an alpha particle and it should go down by 2. And that would also change your mass number. So option A is the answer here. OK. Question 15. There are 100 students in year 10. Each student studies exactly one of French, German or Spanish. Uh, X girls study French and there are three X girls in total. Two Y boys study German. There are 35 students studying Spanish, Y of which are boys. Uh, which of the following is an expression for the total number of students studying German? OK, tough one. So first thing I notice is there are three X girls in total. And there are 100 students. So there are, let's write this down, boys is 100 minus 3X. OK. X girls study French, so two X boys study French. So um, French boys is two X. Okay. Two Y boys study German, 
Okay, so we're looking for the total number of students studying German. So we know that we can say that's 2y boys plus the number of girls studying German. Okay, so 35 students studying Spanish, y of which are boys. So Spanish girls, that's going to be 35 minus y. And we know that there are only three x girls. X of them study French. 35 minus y of them study Spanish. So the rest must study, study German. So we can say the three x girls uh, minus x minus 35 minus y. That would be the number of girls studying German. So if we calculate that, that is going to give us a 2x in there and another y. So it's going to be 3y um, plus 2x minus 35. Is that possible? Uh, yes, that's option F. OK. Question 16, the radius of an iron 56 atom is 3 times 10 to the 4 times greater than the radius of the iron 56 nucleus. What is the value of the density of the iron atom divided by the density of the iron nucleus? So I think what we're supposed to assume here is that the mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus. So let's make the assumption that the electrons weigh nothing, which is a reasonable assumption to make because the mass of a proton is so much higher than the mass of an electron. So what we can do is we can say that these densities, um, we can equate them to really the volume. So we know that density is mass over volume. So if we're using the same mass in both of these densities, those masses would cancel out. And we can say that this ratio is really equivalent to the volume of the nucleus over the volume of the atom. Uh, it switches around because it is inversely proportional, um, the density to the volume. Okay. Uh, now, both of them will be spherical. So both of them would start with a 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. So we can kind of ignore that 4 thirds pi and just call it the radius of the nucleus cubed over the radius of the atom cubed. You can move the cube to the outside and just go radius of the nucleus over radius of the atom all cubed. And we know that the atom is 3 times 10 to the 4 times 3 times 10 to the 4 times greater than the, than the radius of the nucleus. So this is going to be a 1 over 3 times 10 to the 4 cubed. Which of our options is the same as that? So if we have a 1 over, that makes that 3 a minus 3. So it's option A. OK, question 17. An exterior angle of a regular polygon with n sides is 4 degrees larger than the exterior angle of a regular polygon with n plus 3 sides. OK, what is the value of n? OK, interesting. So the exterior angle of, a, of an n-sided polygon is equal to 360 degrees divided by those n sides. OK, so you can think of it as as you go round the polygon, you're turning at each exterior angle, and you're going to end up facing the same direction as you've gone all the way around. So you might be facing that way, and then you're facing this way, and then you're facing this way, and then finally you're going to turn again and face the original direction. So all of those angles, all those exterior angles, are going to add to 360. And I've just drawn the one for a um, the one for a uh, square here. So all of them are 90 in the case of a square. OK, so if we consider this equation then, we can say that 360 divided by n is 4 more than 360 divided by n plus 3. So 
There we are, that's the equation. Now, I could probably cancel this straight away, divide everything by 4. I get 90 over n is equal to 1 plus 90 over n plus 3. And I could multiply by n and multiply by n plus 3 to make a big, uh, messy quadratic. Or I could just try some of these values. So some of them can be ruled out straight away. So um, I know that 10 won't work because if I put n in as 10, I'm doing 90 divided by 13. And, and 13 doesn't go into 90, so it can't be that one. Um, if I try 12, 90, does that divide by... 12, don't think so. So 15, let's try that one. 90 divided by 15 is 6. And is that equal to 1 plus 90 divided by 18? Yes, 90 divided by 18 is 5. So the answer is C. And that's a little bit quicker. Even if I had to go through all of them, I think that would be quicker than all of that algebraic mess that you'd get from trying to solve the quadratic. So... Question 18, um, this shows the, graph one shows the displacement of one of the particles of a medium with time in seconds as a wave travels through that medium. And the second graph shows the displacement in meters um, at one time for the same wave. Okay, interesting. Which expression gives the speed of the wave in meters per second? So they gave everything here. In, in meters and seconds, so we don't really need to worry about the units. Um, what we're going to use here is velocity equals frequency of the wave times the wavelength, or even better, uh, wavelength over time period. Okay, so it's going to be in terms of this x1, x2, and t1 and t2. So the distances on this on this graph, this this distance here is equal to t2 minus t1, and this is x2 minus x1, okay? So x2 minus x1, you can see that that's just the wavelength divided by two, because the wavelength is between two peaks or between two troughs. So this is the wavelength divided by two, and here we actually have a full time period plus a half. So this is three, time period over two, three, uh, three halves of the time period. Okay, so if we work out this ratio x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1, that's going to be lambda over two divided by three over two times the time period. So we can cancel out the halves on the top and the bottom, and we actually end up with the velocity of the wave divided by three. So we would need to multiply both sides of this equation by three to get the velocity of the wave. So the answer is E, okay. Question 19, the bearing of a ship R from a lighthouse L is 220 degrees. A canoe C is due north of R, C is the same difference from the ship and the lighthouse. What is the bearing of L from C? Okay, this requires a bit of a drawing. So I'm going to put my lighthouse L here. And I know that a bearing of 270 degrees is west. So that would be west. So 220 degrees is just 50 degrees less than that. So something like this, I can write that as 50 degrees in there. And this whole angle here would be 220 degrees. Okay, so this is where the ship is, R. And the canoe is due north of R. So the canoe is here. And it's the same distance from L. Okay, so we've got a uh, isosceles triangle here. And we're asked for the bearing of L from C. So that would be the same as saying, what is this angle from north that the canoe would have to turn to face the lighthouse L? So we're looking for this angle here. We can see that this angle in the triangle here would be 100 degrees. So 
2 times 50 degrees. So each of these two angles here, which must be equal because it's an isosceles triangle, must be 40 degrees. And so the bearing must be 180 minus 40 degrees, which is 140 degrees. So that's that angle there. And the answer is E. OK, question 20. A kettle is designed to work from a car's power socket. The kettle has a power rating of 150 watts when a constant voltage of 12 volts DC is applied across the element. Okay. How much charge passes through the element of this kettle when the voltage of 12 volts is applied across it for 20 minutes? Okay, so we're going to use two equations here. Um, we can say that power is energy transmitted over time and also this energy in a circuit is charge times voltage. That's a direct current circuit. Okay, so the power is 150 watts. So if we do 150 watts times 20 minutes, we'll change that 20 minutes into seconds, so 20 times 60, that would give our energy. But we don't really want the energy, we want the charge, so we need to divide that energy by the voltage, which is 12 volts. So if I do 60 divided by 12, that gives me just a 5 here. 5 times 20 is 100, so it's 150 times 100, so the answer is C, 15,000 coulombs. Okay, question 21. The hands of a 12-hour analog clock move continuously. When the time of the clock is 4 o'clock, the angle between the minute hand and the hour hand is 120 degrees. What is the angle between the two hands at 440? Okay, 440 is going to look something like this. Here's 4, let's say here's 5, and here's 8. So if the hour hand didn't move um, continuously, then we would be pointing at 8 and 4, and that would be a difference of 120 degrees. But it isn't that. It can't be that because the hour hand is constantly moving, so it's actually going to be two-thirds of the way to 5 o'clock. Okay, so we need to work out this small angle here, which represents a movement of two-thirds of an hour. 40 minutes is two-thirds of 60 minutes. So what we can do is we can say that one hour is going to be 360 degrees, the full circle, divided by the 12 hours in it. So that is 30 degrees. So two thirds of an hour is just two thirds of 30 degrees, which is 20 degrees. So we are looking for 120 degrees, the full distance from eight till four, full angle, take away 20 degrees, that's just 100 degrees. So the answer is B. Okay, question 22. A freight train traveling on a straight horizontal track at two meters per second collides with a passenger train traveling at five meters per second in the opposite direction. Both trains immediately come to a complete stop on the track. Okay, that means the momentum of one is equal but in the opposite direction to the momentum of the other one. You can just apply conservation of momentum here. So if you end with zero momentum, you must have started with a total of zero momentum. Okay, so the freight train has three locomotives, 130 tons each, um, seven container wagons of 30 tons each. Okay, so three locomotives, that's 390 tons together, and seven container wagons, that's 210 tons. If you add those together, you get 600 tons. Okay, so the freight train was tra traveling at 2 meters per second, and that has to be equal to the passenger train, which is traveling at 5 meters per second and has two locomotives of 70 tons, so that's 140, and a number of passenger carriages of 10 tons each. We need to work out how many passenger carriages there are, so let's say it's plus 10x. 
and we can multiply this by our speed, which is 5. Okay, so something that we could do here to simplify things a little bit is divide everything by 10. Okay, and then we have 120 is equal to 14 um, plus x times 5. Sorry, my x's look a bit like my times. So if I divide 120 by 5, I will get 24. So x must be 10. And that's the option C here. OK. A pet shop has four female rabbits and x male rabbits for sale. A customer buys two of the rabbits chosen at random. And each rabbit is equal, equally likely to be chosen. OK, great. The probability that they are that both the chosen rabbits are male is one third. What is the value of x? Okay, so best to draw a tree diagram here. So we're buying two rabbits. So we're going to need sort of two uh, branches on our tree, two two sort of generations. So four of the rabbits are female, and x of the rabbits are male. So we need to work out the probability that both of the chosen rabbits are male. So in the first choice, the male choice is x males over x plus 4 total rabbits. And then in the second choice, we haven't replaced any of the rabbits. So we now have x minus 1 male rabbits. So this is male, male. And we have x plus three total rabbits left. So multiplying both of these together should give us one third. Okay, so I need a bit of room here to do this. So I'm gonna get x squared minus x over x squared plus seven x plus 12 is equal to one third. Okay, so if I sort of cross multiply here, I will end up with 3x squared minus 3x is equal to all of this stuff moved over here. I can start to cancel that out, so I can make it 2x squared. Okay, so I'm going to take away another 7x is minus 10x, and then I'm going to take away the 12, and that's going to be equal to 0. So I need to solve this quadratic to find my answer. Hopefully we'll get a negative and a positive answer so I can rule out which one is my true answer. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give negative 24 and add to give negative 10. So those two numbers could be minus 12 and plus 2, okay, minus 12 and plus 2. So if I divide, if I take the negative of both of those numbers, 12 and minus 2, and then divide by the number at the front, the 2, that will give me my answers. So it's 12 over 2 and minus 2 over 2, which is 6, or minus 1, so I know the answer is going to be 6. So that's C, okay. Next question, consider the following three statements about a parachutist of 72 kilograms falling vertically at a constant velocity of 5 meters per second after the parachute has opened. The parachutist has a constant kinetic energy of 18,000 joules. The parachutist is losing gravitational potential energy at a rate of 36,000 joules per second. The air resistance and the force of gravity acting on the parachutists are Newton's third law pairs of forces. Okay, so I can rule out straight away three because in Newton's third law, the two types of forces have to be the same. So in fact, the parachutists uh, weight, the Newton's third law equivalent of that is actually the force of gravity pulling the earth towards the parachutist. Okay, so those are the Newton's third law pair there, not um, the air resistance and the weight. 
So the parachutist has a constant kinetic energy of 1800 joules. Well, that is just half mv squared. So that's 72 divided by 2 times 25. So I don't think that will work out. That's 36 times 25. Um, no, I don't think that's going to work out. That's not the right size. So it can't be 1. So you don't have to do every single calculation to the end. If you can see the size of it is not going to be equivalent. I just I just times um, 36 by uh, 20. I got you know 720. So I knew that's not not in the ballpark of 1800 joules. Uh, the parachutist is losing gravitational potential energy at a rate of um, 3600 joules per second. So. We know that it's lo the, the, the parachutist is losing 5 metres of height every second. So if we do mgh and say that every second he goes down 5 metres, we actually end up with 72 times 10 times 5. And yes, that is going to be equal to 3600. So the answer is 2 only. OK. Question 25, the diagram shows a square with the side of x centimetres. A circle is drawn um, with its centre at zero, which lies at the midpoint uh, of one of the sides of the square. Uh, this side forms part of the diameter. OK, what is the area in centimetres squared of the shaded part of the semicircle? OK, so we really want to be able to say what the radius is in terms of x. So if I just draw on a radius here, the sort of obvious one goes from the middle to the corner of the square. And I know that this distance here is x and this distance, sorry, x over 2. And this distance here is x. So we can use Pythagoras to work out the radius. So the radius squared is equal to um, x squared over 4 plus x squared. So that's just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So I'm just going to write this as 5 over 4 x squared. Now, if I'm looking for the area of a semi of the semicircle here, I can just say that's pi r squared over 2, which is equal to um, 5 over 8 x squared. Okay, so that's the that's the semicircle. Now all I need to do is take away an x squared from this because that's the area of my square. So is that going to work out? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm missing a pi here. Let me just multiply by pi. There we are. Okay, so I need to find which option looks something like this. So I can see one there with a 5 pi over 8. Yes, the option is going to be f. Um, if you take the x squared out, you can see that you've got 5 pi over 8 minus 1. So you could write that as 8 over 8, and that gives you f. OK. Question 26. Two radioactive sources, x and y, have half-lives of 3 hours and 2 hours, respectively. The product of the decay of both of the, of the sources is the stable isotope of the element Z. Six hours ago, a mixture contained the same number of atoms of both X and Y and no other atoms. What fraction of the mixture is now made up of atoms of Z? OK, so six hours ago. So at the beginning, you have half of your atoms are X, OK, but six hours later you've had two half lives so you're going to go to one quarter of your atoms are x and then finally one eighth of your atoms are x so if an eighth of your atoms are x and you started with half of your atoms being x that must mean that you have three eighths of z okay so three eighths of z here now if we do the same thing with y we started with a half we went to a quarter, then we went to an eighth, and then we went to one sixteenth. 
So you actually find that you started with 8 sixteenths, now you just have 1 sixteenth, so 7 sixteenths of your fraction are now z due to the, the uh, y decay. So we need to add these together, so that becomes 6 sixteenths and 7 sixteenths. If you add them together, you get 13 sixteenths. So the answer is D. Okay. Question 27. A cylindrical hollow metal pipe is 16 centimeters long. It has an external diameter of 10 centimeters and an internal diameter of 8 centimeters. The density of the metal from which the pipe is made is 8 grams per centimeter cubed. What is the mass of the pipe in grams? So what we can do is work out the volume of the pipe and multiply it by the density to get the mass. So to work out the volume, we want to do pi times the outer radius squared. So I'm going to call that r2 squared minus the inner radius squared, r1 squared, times the length of the pipe, uh, pipe L. Okay, so that is going to be pi times 100, which is 10 squared, minus uh, 64, which is um, 8 squared, times the length, which is 16. And then we would times that by 8 to give the, uh, the mass. Okay, so this is in centimeters, so that's going to work out fine. So if we take away um, 64 from 100, we get 36 pi times 16. And then to work out the mass, we're just going to times this by a further 8. Um, so this is a bit of a complicated one. Maybe we can um, work it out. It can't be any of these. These are too small. Um, it's not going to be that. So I'm just looking at the size here. I think it's going to be this largest one here. Let me just make sure. So let's just call this, if you multiply these two together, you've basically got 100. Yeah, it's going to be this last one here. So you don't have to actually do the calculation to work this one out. Just say that you multiply these two together, you get something bigger than 100. So the minimum this could be is, is 3. Uh, 3,600 pi, and you know, the the only option here that's sort of bigger than that is this 4,608 pi. Okay, so a car X passes a car Y on the motorway. Car X is traveling at 1.5 times the speed of car Y. The mass of car X is only four fifths the mass of car Y. How do the uh, kinetic energies of the two cars compare? So we're going to be using the formula um, for kinetic energy, which is half mv squared. So it's proportional to mv squared. Okay, so if car x is 1.5 times the speed of car y, we know we would times by 1.5 squared, but we would also times by 4 fifths, which is 0 0.8. So 1.5 squared is 2.25 or um, let's call that 9 over 4, and this is actually equal to 4 over 5, so we're going to end up with 9 over 5, just cancelling out, and 9 over 5 is 1.8, so the answer is E. Okay. So on to part B now, the advanced mathematics and advanced physics. Uh, let's see how much harder it is. So, which one of the following is a simplification of this third expression here? So, kind of a tricky one here. How best to approach this? You don't want to make a mess. So, what we could probably do is look at the root 3s here. Um, maybe we can take out a factor of root 3 squared. Yeah, I think that might be a good idea. So, we could write it as 1 and then it's root 3 squared plus root 3 over 2 times root 3 squared minus 2 
root 3, but all of this is squared. Okay, so first thing to do, maybe we can cancel by some root 3s. So let's cancel that root 3, that root 3, this one, and this one, and we end up with root 3 plus 1 um, over 2 root 3 minus 2. Okay. Um, Perhaps now it looks a little bit easier to solve. I'm just going to try and simplify this fraction first. Root 3 plus 1 over 2 root 3 minus 2. Um, I'm going to take out this factor of 2. So I could write that as 1 minus. So all of this is squared, remember. Um, so if I take out the 2 on the bottom, I could rewrite that as 1 quarter on the outside and then I can kind of get rid of these two here and make this just a one. Okay, so now if I wanted to simplify inside the square root here, sorry, inside the square here, I would multiply top and bottom by the, the uh, root three plus one. So to do the difference of two squares. So I'd end up with root three plus one squared and then on the bottom here, root 3 minus 1 times root 3 plus 1 is 3 minus 1. Okay, just 2. And remember, all of this is squared, and I do still have a quarter on the outside and a 1 minus here. Okay, so you can see why they gave you plenty of room to do this question. So if I want to sort of simplify this, I know I'm going to get 1 minus a quarter. And then I'm going to get another factor of a quarter from the 2 on the bottom squared. And then I'll actually have root 3 plus 1 squared on the inside. And then I think squared again, so to the power of 4. Um, so maybe I can do that. Um, let's have a look. So that's going to be root 3 to the 4. Okay. Hmm. So I'll probably square it and then square it again. So let's make that 3 plus 1 plus 2 root 3. And I'm going to square that. So that's 4 plus 2 root 3. So I could actually take out the factor of 2. And that's actually a factor of 2 squared. So that would cancel out one of my quarters. So I can write it as 1 minus 1 quarter times 2 plus root 3 squared still. Okay, nearly there. That's 1 minus 1 quarter, and then we have 4 plus 4 root 3 plus 3. So we can write that as 1 minus, okay, let's put the quarter on the inside now. So minus 1 minus root 3 and minus 3 over 4. So these two cancel, and we've got minus root 3 minus 3 over 4. Is that an option? Minus 3 over 4 minus root 3, so that's option E. Okay, quite a nasty, nasty question there to simplify, to simplify that. Um, yeah, the only advice I have for you is just to um, have a go, see if you can spot like terms on the top and bottom and cancel it out early. Um, it kind of looks like it might be a difference of two squares here. Perhaps you could do it like that. I think that might actually be even harder than what we did here. Um, but yeah, just, just do your best on these ones. Okay, question 30. The diagram shows a crane being used on a building site. The crane is perfectly balanced about the point P. Okay, fine. The load is now moved to the left by five meters. Okay. To keep the crane perfectly balanced about P, how far does the counterweight have to move, and in which direction? Well, if what they're trying to do here is maybe confuse you because of the weight of the crane, they haven't told you where it is and how much it is. So you don't really need to worry about that, though. If it's perfectly balanced about P, you just have to talk about the added counterclockwise moment. That must be... Uh, counteracted by the um, added clockwise moment. Okay, so we know we moved this load by five meters, so that's going to be 
a 400 kilograms times 10 times 5. I'm not going to bother with the timesing by G to give the, the weight because uh, we know that, that both the counterweight and the load, their weights are going to be mg. So you don't need the g on both sides. So if we do 400 times 5, that has got to be equal to 2000 times a distance d. Okay, And it's clear that if you move uh, the load uh, of 400 kilograms, if you move that to the left, then you're going to have to move the counterweight to the right. So that rules out quite a few of these options here. So 400 times 5 is actually 2,000, so D is just 1. So it's, it's 1 meter to the right, so it's B. Okay, question 31. K is the smallest positive value of x, which is a solution to both the equations 2 sine x plus 1 equals 0 and 2 cos 2x equals 1. How many values of x in the range of 0 to k are solutions to at least one of these equations. Okay, so basically they're asking us to solve these two equations, find a series of solutions, and find a solution that is a solution to both of those, and look at all the ones before that. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's do the first one here with the sine. So that's going to be sine x equals negative one half. If I draw sine x just briefly here, I know I'm doing it for a range of 0 to, to k, so we're going to start from 0, we're not going to bother with the negative part of the curve. So where's our first solution where it's equal to negative 1 half? That is going to be here, which we know that sine 30 is 1 half, that is something you should know. Um, so this is going to be 30 degrees here by the symmetry of the graph. So the first solution is going to be at 180 plus 30, which is x is 210. The next solution is going to be here, which is going to be at 330, um, because this is 360. And again, by the symmetry, that's another 30 degree jump there. And then... I might just calculate the next two just to be safe. This is going to be 390, and this would be 540. So 30, oh, sorry, no, of course not these two because that's at x is a half. So the next ones are going to be down here, sorry. So it's not 390. Um, go along to here. That's 540, that point there, 540. So another 30 degrees from there is 5. 70 and then this would be up at the 720 degree point here so taking 30 degrees off of that is 690. Okay so I've calculated a good few of them there just to be sure. Now let's work out the solutions to the other one which is that cos 2x is equal to uh, 1 half. Okay so 2x is going to be equal to, so I'm just going to draw the cos graph here as well. So cos graph looks something like this. Okay, I might need to draw a bit more of it in a minute. So where it's equal to 1 half is at 60 degrees. So that would be 60 degrees on the cos x graph. But because it's 2x, we know that our x is 30 degrees. Okay, the next one would be at 300 degrees, but on our graph it's 150, because we're halving each time. So we're going to have to keep drawing this for a little bit. Let's draw just maybe a couple more. So the next point is here, and this is 360, so it's 360 plus another 60 degrees, uh, that would be 420. Aha! So dividing that by 2 you get your 210. Okay, so that's the that's the value of k. 210 is our value of k. So maybe I didn't need to do all of these extra ones here. So 210 is your value of k. How many values of x in the range of 0 to k are solution to at least one of these equations? So that would be 30 on 50 
and 210. There are three solutions because it's up and to and including K. So the answer is C. Okay. So question 32, a ball is flown vertically upwards in still air and then is caught at the same height when it comes back down. Which velocity time graph shows this complete motion? So remember the gradient of the velocity time graph is acceleration. And if we are constantly accelerating downwards, we're told to take upwards of positive, upwards is positive here. So we're constantly accelerating downwards. So we need a constant acceleration that points you know, it's got a negative gradient, right? It's going to have to point downwards. So A could be a solution, but B and C definitely couldn't. They don't have constant gradients. Nor could E and F. Um, and G is not right because we're supposed to take upwards of positive. You start with an acceleration in an upwards direction. And H is not right because, um, again, no constant gradient here. So that leaves D and A. And I think the answer is going to be A because remember it's caught at the same height from which it was thrown. So these, this area under the curve here um, counters to the, the area that's sort of the area between these two points here is the same as the area here. So if you kind of do the integral with velocity against time you're going to get zero for this graph whereas you're actually going to get a positive number for this graph, which would mean that, that it, it's, it travels away from its original position only. Okay, um, You can also think of it as if it reaches the top of its motion and then starts to fall back down again, then this velocity has to at some point go negative. So that's why the answer is A. Okay. So question 32, which of the following is the solution to this equation? Okay, so we could write this as 3 to the 2x plus 1 is equal to 2 times 3 times 3x. Okay, so I can write this as 2 times 3 3x plus 1 and 3 to the 2x uh, plus 1 here. Now if I do log to the base 3 on this, I'm just going to get 2x plus 1 on this side and I will get x plus 1 from my, from my 3 on this side plus a log to the base 3 of 2. Okay. So I can cancel the 1s here, and I can cancel the x. So x is equal to log to the base 3 of 2. Um, so that is b. OK, good. So an aircraft is climbing at a constant speed in a straight line at an angle of 10 degrees to the horizontal. Which statement about the resultant force on the aircraft is correct? It's parallel to its motion. It's perpendicular to its motion, it's zero, it's equal to its weight, it's equal to the drag acting on the aircraft. So it's climbing at a constant speed. Constant speed, that means acceleration is zero, so the resultant force is zero. Okay? It's just as simple as that. F equals ma, or you can think of this as a Newton's first law. If something continues with the same velocity in a, in a sort of constant direction, that must mean that its resultant force is zero. Okay. Question 35. Uh, the diagram shows a keyhole constructed of three uh, straight uh, sides and an arc. Okay. Um, the sides PQ and RS have 18 millimeters in length each. Okay, so that's 18 there and 18 on the other side as well. The longer arc from Q to R is 22 pi millimeters. What is the area in millimeters square, uh, squared of the keyhole as shaded in the diagram? Okay, so for this problem, we're going to use arc length is equal to the angle times the radius, as long as that, that angle is in radians. So we actually know that this angle here, if we use arc length is 22 pi, and 
we know that um, we want to work out kind of I think this this radius here. Um, so let me just have a little look at this. So the longer arc length is this. Um, meter meter length when extended meet at the center O forming an angle of pi over six radians. So that there is pi over six radians. So that must mean that this angle round the edge is five pi over six radians. So, oh, sorry, not five pi over six. Uh, it's going to be uh, 11, 11 pi over six. So two, two pi radians in a circle. So let me put an 11 pi over six here. So we've got 11 pi over six times r. So we're trying to work out our radius here. So if I divide by 11 pi on both sides, that just becomes a one there and that becomes a two here. So my radius is 12 millimeters. Okay, so what I'm gonna to want to do is split this into three shapes. Um, I'm gonna to want to use the circle, the sector, and the triangle um, OPS, okay? So if we have those three shapes, if we knew the area of all three of those shapes, we could work out the total area. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write these down. So the area of my circle is equal to just uh, pi r squared, pi r squared, which is 144 pi millimeters squared, okay. Now, the sides of my triangle, we now know that they're 30 millimeters, and we know this angle in the middle is pi over six. So if we use half AB sine C, sine of pi over six is just one half, so it's one quarter times 30 times 30. So my area of my triangle is equal to one half a b sine c. So that's actually one half times 30 squared times sine pi over six. And so that's equal to 30 squared is 900. So this is 900 over four, 900 over four. Uh, 900 over 2 is 450, so 450 divided by 2 is 225. Okay, so now I've got my triangle. Um, now I need my area of my um, sector, which is kind of a pizza slice shape um, in the middle there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say my area of my circle plus my area of my triangle take away my area of my sector. That's going to equal my my full area of my keyhole. Okay, so this sector, there's another formula for this. As long as the angle is in radians, you can use the area is going to be equal to one half times the radius squared times the angle. Okay, so one half times, uh, times 12 squared times pi over six. So one half, times 12 squared times pi over six. That's going to be, so if I do one half times one of the 12s, that gives me a six. So it's going to be six times 12 times pi over six. If I cancel the sixes, it's just 12 pi. Okay, just 12 pi. So what I'm gonna end up having in the end is 144 pi, take away 12 pi, that will give me 132 pi, and then added onto that is 225. So that option is C there. Okay. A horizontal uniform bar of mass 60 kilograms uh, is four meters long and is pivoted at one end. Uh, the bar is held in equilibrium by a force F at the other end of the bar, acting at an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal, which expression gives the magnitude of F in Newtons? So there's two ways you can do this. Um, the way that's taught 
in most British schools is you take the line of the force and where that meets the perpendicular line to the pivot, so where this length here is, where those two lines intersect and it's perpendicular, this is the distance that you want to use. Okay, so this is pretty easy to work out here. And that's 60 degrees as well because uh, these two angles are going to be the same. And this is your four meters is your uh, is your hypotenuse of this right angle triangle here. So this distance d is going to be equal to um, four sine 60. That's your distance. So if you multiply that by f, you get your anti-clockwise moment. And that anti-clockwise moment is equal to um, 60g times 2. Okay, so the way that I might do this is 60 times uh, g is 10, so it's going to be 600 times 2 is equal to f times 4 times sine 60. Okay, so let's divide by 4 here, and I can make that 600 divided by 2, which is just 300. So 300 is equal to f sine 60, so f is equal to 300 divided by sine 60. Okay, um, so that's going to be e. Another way that you can always do it is if you split this force f into its uh, vertical and horizontal components, you can see that the vertical component is the only component that um, that actually will pr produce a moment. And then you can just use that vertical component of the force times a distance of four meters to, to work out the, uh, the anti-clockwise moment. Okay, 37. It is given that y is equal to eight to the power of p. Z is equal to a half to the power of 2q. P and q are real numbers. Which of the following expressions is a simplification of log to the base 2 of y cubed over z um, squared? OK, so we could write this as log 2. I'm going to move the powers to the front. 3y minus log 2, 2, and z. OK, so I've just used the, the rules of logarithms here that dividing is taking away with logarithms. And if you have a power in your logarithm, you can move it to the front. OK, so if I now use log to the base 2 of 8p, um, then 8 is really 2 cubed. And to the power of p is um, 2 to the power of 3p, if I do a log two of that, the log two kind of cancels with the power of two. So you would end up with three times three p. And then on the other side, you've got minus two. And if we look at what z is in terms of powers of two, you could write z as two to the negative two q. So doing log to the base two of that just, just brings the, um, the power into play and, and it ignores the powers of 2 now. So it's just going to be minus 2q times minus 2. So you can end up with 9p plus 4q. And that is f. OK. A ball starts with a speed of 40 meters per second. The ball is subject to a constant deceleration of 14.4 meters per second as it travels a distance of 20 meters in a straight line, what is the final speed of the ball? So this is a SUVAT equation, S-U-V-A-T. Um, we know the distance that it travels is 20 meters. We know it has an initial speed of 40. We know it is subject to a constant deceleration of minus 14.4. And we know that the final speed, well, we're actually looking for the final speed. OK, so we have this. We, we don't need t, so it's the equation v squared equals, equals u squared plus 2as. OK, so um, v 
squared is equal to 1600 um, plus 2. And I'm going to actually, I'm actually going to write this A. 144, it kind of looks like a square to me, so I'd call it 12 squared divided by 10. Okay, that's the way I, I would look at it. Um, so if you write this, you can say it's 2 um, times minus 12 squared over 10 um, multiplied by uh, 20. So if I cancel out the 10 and 20, just to give me a 2. Um, so this is going to be 4 times four, 4 times 144. So that will be 400 and 144. So we need to we need to multiply 40 by 4. That's 160 and then 16. So I could add all of those up. That's going to add to 576. So I'm going to be taking away 576 from from this 1600 and then I'm going to be square rooting it. So if you think about it, when you square root this, you're going to get, it's going to be quite close to uh, 1000, right? I think if you take away 576 from this, um, you would get 1000, taking away 76 and 24. Okay, so if I'm going to square root that, um, what could I say about that? Um, so if I square rooted 1000, we could say that's 10 times 100. So you could call it um, root 10 times 10. Yeah, um, root 10 is about 3, so it's, a, it's probably going to be a bit more than 30. That's the answer I'm looking for, the one that's a bit more than 30. So I think probably 32. And actually, yeah, I think that makes sense because um, so 1,024, that is actually, um, I think, 2 to the 10, if you know your binary. So if you do the square root of that, you can have 2 to the 5, which is 32. OK, so um, a little bit tricky there, but just tricky on the calculation, really. So a graph of the function y equals x cubed plus px squared plus qx plus 6, where p and q are real constants, has a local maximum where x equals 2 and a local minimum where x equals 4. What are the values of p and q? So this is definitely a differentiation problem. Um, if you differentiate it, you'll get the gradient function. And at the maximum and minimum, those, those number, the gradient is going to be 0. So Let's differentiate this. That'll be 3x squared plus 4px plus q. Okay, that's equal to our gradient. So that is equal to 0 when x is 2 and when q is 4. So and when x is 4. So what we need to say is, is if we put in 2, we're going to have 12 plus 8p plus Q. Okay, and if we put in x is 4, then we're going to have 0 is equal to 3 times 16, which is 48, um, plus 16p plus q. Okay, um, so these two equations, if I take them away from each other, I can eliminate that q. So let's do equation 2 minus equation 1, and we're going to get... Um, 0 is equal to 36 um, plus 8p. So minusing the, uh, minusing the 36 to the other side, uh, that does not cancel entirely. So made a mistake somewhere here. What have I done wrong? So I'm just trying these numbers again just to make sure that that's right. 4 squared is still 16, 3 times 16, yeah, that's fine, 16 plus q, what have I made a mistake here, um, okay, I could try, where is 36, 8p, um, there is an error here, so what have I done wrong, 
If I divide them both by 4, I get minus 9 is 2p. Um, that's not right, though, because I don't want 4.5 as my solution. So qx 2p squared. Ah, what a silly mistake. So that should just be a 2p there. Sorry, differentiating a bit, bit fast for me there. Okay, so I'm going to write that as a 4. That will be an 8. So 4 take away an 8, that's just going to be a 4. So my p is not going to be... My p is just going to be 9. Okay. Um, so my p is just going to be minus 9, sorry. Okay, so then I can use that to work out my q. If I put that into equation 1, I'm going to get... Um, 12 minus 36 plus q, so q is going to be minus uh, 24. Sorry, q is going to be 24. Um, so minus 9 and 24, that is d. Okay. Question 40. A block of 1 kilogram is at rest on a rough horizontal surface. The block is attached to a light inextensible string. Um, uh, to a force meter, okay, so that force meter is measuring the tension, um, the other end is attached to another light extensible string, okay, with a mass of one kilogram. Right, so if we consider the forces on this mass first, there's a tension going up and there's a weight of 10 newtons going down, and I think everything is not moving, right? Everything is stationary, so that tension must just be equal to 10 newtons. And then the tension here should be exactly the same. So the force meter will measure this tension of 10 newtons, and that's the answer, 10 newtons. It's a sort of weird question, this one here. I think they're trying to complicate things with a friction here, but you just know that if you have a friction in this direction, and a tension in this direction, the tension and the friction must be the same as well. So, but the reading on the force meter should just be the the tension in the in the in the rope there. So, question forty one: a triangle PQR, and they've given you some of the um, some of the lengths here. Uh, what is the maximum value of the area in centimeters squared? So just to be sure, I'm going to draw PQR. Okay, I'll call that P. Oops. I'll call that P. I'll call that Q. And I'll call that R. So I'm given PQ is 4x. I'm given QR is 8 minus 3x. And we know this angle is 60 degrees. We're going to be using half AB sine C. So sine 60 here, or you can use... Um, half uh, PQQR times sine of the angle PQR here. It's just got to be two sides and the angle in the middle. Um, so if we do that here, sine C is just going to be sine of 60, which is root 3 over 2. Okay, A and B is going to be uh, 4x, but remember we've got a half at the front, so I'm going to make that 2x times 8 minus 3x times root 3 over 2. And I can cancel this 2 and this 2 here. So I'm going to end up with root 3 times um, x, 8 minus 3x. Okay, so it asks what's the maximum value of this area. Now, one thing that you can do here, you don't have to differentiate this. So if we look at this x times 8 minus 3x, we could draw that as a function of x. So if we did, that would be a parabola, but it's got a negative value of in front of the x squared. It would be negative 3x squared, and it would have two solutions, one of them at 8 over 3, and one of them at zero, right? This gives you the solutions here. If you put x times eight minus three x in brackets equals zero, this would give you the two solutions. And you know your maximum, because these graphs are always symmetrical about their roots, is going to be in the middle at four over three. 
So what you want to do is now calculate this function at 4 over 3. So that's 4 over 3, and that is 8 minus 4 times 3, which is just 4. So that's going to give you 4. So it's going to be 16 over 3 times root 3, um, which is D. OK. Question 42. An apple of mass 100 grams growing on a tree falls vertically from a height of 4 meter above the ground. Uh, it hits the ground with a speed of 8 meters per second. How much work does the apple do against resistive forces during its descent before it hits the ground? So this is just equating um, the energy at the start to the energy at the end. And there must be an energy loss due to, the, uh, due to overcoming these resistive forces. So at the beginning, you just have gravitational potential energy. And that's just mgh. So that's equal to 0 0.1 times 10 times 4. So that's just equal to 4 joules. And at the end, you have mv squared over 2. That's equal to 0 0.1 times how fast is it when it hits the ground? 64 divided by 2, which is going to be equal to 3.2. So it loses 0 0.8 joules of energy to these resistive forces. So that's the work done against these resistive forces. OK. So given that y equals 2 plus 3x to the power of 6, what is the coefficient of x cubed in dy dx? So if we're differentiating something and we get an x cubed, we must have started with the x to the 4 power. OK. So we just need to work out the coefficient on the x to the 4. So if it's x to the 4, that means that it's got a 3x um, all to the power of 4, and it's got a 2 to the power of 2, OK? But also, we need to know the, um, the coefficient from the binomial expansion. So what I would do is just do a very quick uh, Pascal's triangle, 3, 1, 1, 4, 4, 6, 1, 1. 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, 1. Okay, this is the 6 one, so it's 6, 15, uh, 20, 15, 6, 1. Sorry, I'm running out of room here. Um, but there you are, that's it. Maybe you want to memorize maybe the the fifth um, the fifth line on the on the Pascal's triangle, and then you can sort of start from there if they give you a high number. Um, okay, so we need the coefficient of the x to the 4, so that's 1, so that's x to the 0, x to the 1, x to the 2, x to the 3, x to the 4, so it's going to be a 15. So we know that we're going to have 15 times 2 squared, which is 4, times 3 to the 4, which is 81, and then that's going to be times by x to the power of 4. But remember, when we differentiate that, that's going to be 4x cubed. So this is the, the expansion that we're looking at. Um, so maybe we don't want to actually work it all out. We want to maybe make approximations. Um, so I would call this 15 times 16 times 81. Um, maybe I would say that this is, well, I could work out 15 times uh, 16. So uh, 15 times 4 is 60, and then just times that by 4 again is 240, times 80. OK, I can just times that by 80. So 240 times 80, um, so 8 times uh, eight times 200 is 1,600. Um, so then I'd add, um, add an extra 0 to that. And then 4 times 80, or 40 times 80, is 3200. Zero, zero. If I add them together, it's 9. Uh, 19,200. So I want one that's just a little bit more than that, and that's E. Okay, good. So a stone is fired vertically upwards at a speed of 13 meters per second on a still day from the top of a six meter high cliff. It then falls down and lands at the bottom of the cliff. Fine. From when the stone passes the top of the cliff on the way down, how long does it take to reach the ground at the bottom of the cliff? Okay, fine. So 
Well, what we know is if you launch it up at 13 meters per second, then it, when it passes that height again, it's going to be moving at 13 meters per second downwards. The reason for that is you need to conserve energy. Um, so if you start with um, 13 meters per second um, as your velocity, then you have a certain kinetic energy and you return to that same height. So you're going to have to have the same kinetic energy to conserve energy. So you need the same speed. But of course, you're traveling in the opposite direction. So from when the stone passes the top of the cliff on the way down, how long does it take to reach the ground at the bottom of the cliff? This is just SUVAT. So I'm going to take downwards as my positive direction. And I know I'm going to travel six meters. I know U is 13. I don't know my V, I do know my A is going to be 10, and then I have three of them, so I'm just looking for my time. So I'm going to use S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared, so I'm going to call that 6 is equal to 13T um, plus a half of 10 is 5, 5T squared. Okay, this is a quadratic, so I can try and solve this. So I can write this as 5t squared plus 13t uh, um, minus 6 equals 0. So I'm looking for something that two numbers that multiply to give um, minus 30 and add to 13. So I think that's going to be minus 15 and uh, 2. Oh, sorry, no, the other way around, plus 15 and minus 2, okay, so it's got to add to 13, and then I'm looking for the negative of those two, so that'd be 15 and 2, and then I'm going to divide both of them by my number at the start, which is 5. So this is going to give me t equals minus 3, and t equals uh, 2 over 5, which is 0 0.4. So the answer is a, 0 0.4 seconds. Now, what does this minus 3 represent, this t equals minus 3? Um, that actually represents the time it took from the point that I threw it. Okay, So this is actually like saying, um, if you threw it from down here, how long would it have taken to get up to this point 13, moving downwards with 13 there? So it would have, if you threw it from the ground down here, um, that's what that three seconds represents. It would have taken three seconds to get to this point here. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, all right, so question 45. A geometric progression has a first term equal to 1 and a common ratio of 1 half sine 2x. The sum to infinity of this series is 4 over 3. Find the possible values of x in the range um, pi to 2 pi. So this is in radians. So we need to know this formula for the sum to infinity. Um, it is the first term over 1 minus the common ratio, r. So in our case, this is 1 over 1 minus 1 half sine 2x equals uh, 4 over 3. So I'm going to sort of flip both of these and make it 3 over 4 is equal to 1 minus 1 half um, sine 2x. OK, so I can say that 1 half sine 2x is equal to 1 quarter. So if I times everything by 2, I can say that sine 2x is equal to, um, if I'm times it by 2 on both sides, 1 half. Okay, so we're looking for when is sine 2x equal to a half in the range of pi to 2 pi. So if I solve it for um, sine x, I'm going to need to look on a longer range. Okay, so let's plot sine x and versus x. Okay, so this is going up to 4 pi here. So the reason I'm doing this, actually let's call it y or something, let's call it sine y. Okay, so let's say that y is equal to 2x, then the range for y 
is going to be double the range of x. So it's going to be 0 up to uh, 2 pi. Okay, sorry. Need to adjust that range, sorry. Um, it's from uh, 2 pi up to 4 pi. Okay, because the original range was pi to 2 pi, this new range has got to be 2 pi up to 4 pi. Okay, for y. So we're actually looking for these two solutions here at between 2 pi and 3 pi. And they are going to be, so sine um, is equal to a half at 30 degrees or pi over 6. So it's going to be 2 pi plus pi over 6 and 3 pi take away pi over 6. So those two solutions for y, okay, so we're going to need to half them to find the x solutions, are going to be at um, 13 pi over 6 and at 17 uh, pi over 6. So they're going to be 13 pi over 12 and 70 pi over 12, um, which is option A. Okay, good. So, question 46, an archer fires an arrow of mass 0.24 kilograms vertically upwards from a bow. The graph shows the force on the bowstring, so the force of the bowstring on the arrow and how it varies with the distance as the arrow moves upwards. Okay. The work done by the force of the bowstring is given by the area under the force distance graph. Okay, so we can work that out. Um, so that's just going to be 1 half times 192 times 0 0.4, so it's going to be um, just, uh, what's half of 192? I think that's 96 times 0 0.4, so that's going to be f 4 times 9.6, which is 36, 38.4, yeah, I think it's 38.4. So that's the kinetic energy that our bow is going to have as it leaves the bowstring. Um, so we can rule out all of those 76 ones. Then we need to work out the height, the maximum height that it gains from this point. So the maximum height that it will gain from this point is just by saying that mgh has got to be equal to that kinetic energy. Um, and we need to divide by mg. Now g is 10, so we are going to be dividing by 10 times this mass, which is 0 0.24. So the height is going to be 38.4 divided by 0 0.24. So this is kind of like dividing by nearly a quarter. That's the way that I look at it. So if you're dividing by about a quarter, then you're timesing by four. And four times 38.4 well, that's about 4 times 40, so it's going to be this one with the 160 here, because that's that's roughly 4 times 40, right? So that's B. Okay, question 47. Um, we have a sequence that is given by this strange, um, this strange combination of multiplying by P and then adding 3. Um, so the fourth term is equal to minus 7, what is the value of the sum of the first four terms? Okay, not too bad. So if we try and work out what the fourth term is going to look like, we can just we can just do that by saying u1 is equal to 2, u2 is equal to 2p plus 3, u3 is equal to, so first I'm going to multiply by uh, p, which was 2p squared plus 3p plus 3. Okay, and then u4 is going to equal 2p cubed plus 3p squared plus 3p plus p, uh, sorry, plus 3. Okay, I think that's right. So u4 is equal to minus 7. So this is looking like a cubic to me. So we don't have a method for solving cubics, but we can um, trial some solutions, and we know that the solution is always going to be pretty pretty all right. Okay, they're going to be one or minus one or two or something like that. So if I use the fact that this is minus seven is equal to that 
cubic, I could actually plus 7 to both sides and say that 0 is equal to 2p cubed plus 3p squared plus 3p plus 10. Okay, so then I'm thinking it's got to be a negative number to make this work. Um, and perhaps negative 1 would work. Let's try that. So that would be 0 is negative 2 plus 3 minus 3 plus 10. That doesn't work. Um, what about negative 2 then? So 2 times negative 8 is negative 16. Uh, plus 12, minus 6, um, plus 10, does that work? Um, yes, that works, I think. So one of the solutions is P equals, um, P equals uh, 2. Okay, so p is minus 2, sorry, um, so that gives a solution here. Okay, so is that the right p, though? There should be several answers. So I think if you come up with an integer answer here, you could solve this to find the other two solutions, um, but I think this should work, and possibly the other two solutions won't be integers. So I'm going to suggest that p equaling negative 2 is the integer solution. The other two will be non-integer solutions, and therefore um, you, should, you should take p is equal to negative 2. Otherwise, there would be more than one integer solution, and you wouldn't know which is which, um, because they all meet this requirement of um, u4 equaling negative 7. Okay, so if p is negative 2, what are my values for u2 and u3? Um, well, they are 2 times minus 2 plus 3, that's negative 1, and then if I take negative 1, times it by negative 2, that makes 2 again, and then add 3, that's going to be 5, so I've got 2 minus 1 plus 5 uh, plus negative 7, well that's just going to equal um, that would just equal negative 1. Yeah, so the answer is C, negative 1. Okay, a book of mass M rests on a rough horizontal plane. The surface is now tilted as shown. Okay, the angle of the tilt is 20 degrees. The book slides down the slope at a constant speed. When the uh, What is the acceleration of the book uh, down the slope where the angle is at a tilt of 25 degrees? Okay, this is interesting. So if we think about the forces acting on the book, you have the weight, um, which is mg. And in particular, you can split that weight into an mg uh, cos theta, which is the sort of perpendicular to the plane um, force component. So if you this angle in here will be um, theta that will be theta in there, and this is a right angle. So you can split it into an mg cos theta that goes into the plane. Now that will always be balanced by r. So provided the book does not sink through the surface of the slope, r is equal to mg cos theta. Okay, and the other component, mg sin theta, is the weight component that pushes the book down the slope. So you have this force here, mg sine theta. Okay, you have one other force on the book, which is the friction, which is always given as mu times r. Now mu here is um, what we're going to call our coefficient of friction. Okay, and we can actually work out what this coefficient of friction is in the case of the book sliding at a constant um, at a constant velocity. So if it's at a constant velocity, the mg sine theta must cancel with the mu r. So we can say that mg sine, uh, and I think is at 20 degrees when it's moving at a constant speed. So mg sine 20 degrees is equal to mu times mg cos 20. 
So if you cancel the mg's and then divide by the cos 20, you're going to end up with mu is equal to tan 20 degrees. Okay, that's great. So now we we change the situation where we're tilting it now at, at 25 degrees. So the forces are going to remain the same. Okay, the the R is going to be now mg cos 25 degrees. Um, the force down the slope is now going to be mg sine 25 degrees, and mu is going to remain tan 20 degrees because it's set by the material that the slope is made out of and the material the book is made out of, how rough this horizontal surface is effectively. So if we now uh, use F equals MA, we can say that your force is going to be MG sine 25 minus uh, mu R, which is tan 20 degrees multiplied by mg cos 25 and that is all going to be equal to ma. So you can cancel the m's everywhere and you can get the g on the outside of the brackets because they both have a have a g um, uh, uh, a g factor. So you're going to end up with G, open bracket, sine 25 minus tan 20, cos 25. So that is going to be H here. Okay, good. All right, find a complete set of values of X for which this is true. Okay, so if we're looking at this, we might want to know uh, what this curve on the top looks like and what this curve on the bottom looks like and sort of think about them being multiplied together or divided. So I think multiplication is a little bit easier to do with functions than divided. Um, so I'm just going to call this a cubic multiplied by 1 over x. So 1 over x is quite a, a uh, routine one that people memorize. It kind of looks a little bit like this. It has asymptotes at 0, um, sorry, at, at uh, x is 0 and y is 0, the two x and y um, axes. And it also goes down like there, like that. Okay, so this is what 1 over x looks like. Now, I'd be interested to see um, what x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x minus 4 looks like. Maybe I can find the solutions to that equation, um, because then I would know when it's less than 0 and when it's greater than 0. Okay, um, so... Let's have a think about that. Let's try x equals 1. So that would give you 1 minus 6 plus 9 minus 4. Um, so does that work? Yes, it does. So one of the solutions is x equals 1. So what we can do is we can say that we have a solution here where x equals 1, but we are going to need to know all the solutions here. We're going to need to know all the solutions. So let's now factorize out um, x minus 1. So we can say that x minus 1 times some uh, quadratic would equal our cubic, okay? Because we know uh, x equals 1 is a solution, then we know x minus 1 is a factor uh, from factor remainder theorem, and then we know that we can factor out a quadratic from this cubic, okay? So... What's left to find out is what is what are these coefficients a, b, and c? Well, a has to be one because um, we've got an x cubed with a coefficient of one at the start, so I can just make that a one. And I can also say that c has to be four um, because uh, my my sort of constant term without any x's in it is minus one times c, and minus one times c has got to be equal to my minus 4 up here. So C just has to be a plus 4. Okay, B is the only tricky one because it lies kind of in the middle. And you could say that you've got a minus 1 times Bx, so that's a minus B, and a 4 times x. So you get a minus B plus 4. That has got to be equal to the coefficient of 9 on the x over here. Um, you can use the x squared if you want, and you can use the x squared to check if you if you want to do that. 
Um, but just here now, I think I'm confident to say that, that b is therefore going to be minus 5. So this quadratic is going to be x squared minus 5x um, plus 4. And I'm quite confident I'm right because this factorizes quite nicely into x uh, minus 4, x uh, minus 1. Okay, so if you fully factorize this, this cubic on the top, you have an x minus 1 squared and x minus 4. So to draw this, if I'm going to draw this, it has a repeated root. And its repeated root is actually at uh, 1. So what the curve will look like is it will go up from negative infinity until it first touches the curve at 1, but it will only touch it because it's a repeated root, so it also coincides with a uh, maxima on this graph or a turning point in general on a cubic, and then it will turn around and it will also cut the graph at 4, so this point here will be 4. Sorry about this kind of messy diagram. But the important thing is where are these two graphs greater than 0 and less than 0? Okay, so there's this idea that um, if I draw this line down here, I know it's going to cut the y-axis um, sorry, the yeah, it's going to cut the y-axis, this would be minus 4 down here. Um, so the cubic is going to be negative at less than 0. And also, the 1 over x will be negative uh, when x is less than 0. So if you multiply two things that are negative together, you'll get something positive. So one of my sort of uh, regions for, these, for this being greater than 0 is x is less than 0. The other region is going to be um, at x is less than um, 4. OK, so x is less than 0, x is uh, less than 4. I'm uh, sorry, greater than 4, sorry, um, because both of them are positive in that region, right? So your other curve kind of looks like this. I want to draw them on the same axis, something like that. And this point here is 4. So after, after 4, both of your... Both of your... Uh, um, both of your functions are positive, so a positive function multiplied by a positive function will give you a positive answer. So the answer is A, x has to be less than 0 or it can be greater than 4. When it's greater than 4, both the curves are positive. When it's less than 0, both the curves are negative. So when you multiply them together, you, you get something positive. Okay, actually quite a tough question that one there. A suitcase of mass m is on a conveyor belt which moves upwards at a constant speed, uh, at an angle of theta to the horizontal, the coefficient of friction between the suitcase and the slope is mu. The suitcase does not slip, even if uh, angle theta is made slightly larger. Which expression gives the friction force between the suitcase and the belt? So I think the trick here is that the it's moving upwards at a constant speed. So it's another one of these kind of trick questions where it's moving at a constant speed, so acceleration is zero. And so the force moving it up the slope is kind of a friction force, okay, because the slope is moving. It should move relative to the belt, but it will move relative to an observer. Um, so this friction force is kind of creating motion here. Um, and that force there is the friction, okay? Um, but it will also have this component, the weight force, which points down the slope, okay? And that component of the weight force is mg, um, mg sine theta. But both of these must be equal to each other if you're not accelerating. So there's no mu required here. You don't really need to... to you know, if you actually uh, decompose this force fully and work out the 
um, the reaction force, that's not really going to be necessary. Um, just because you, you're in the end you're going to say the acceleration is zero and so friction must equal the force down the slope. Um, so the answer is B. Okay, the curve y equals sine x is stretched by a scale factor of one half parallel to the y so sorry parallel to the x-axis and then translated by pi over four in the negative x direction. What is the new equation? Um, what is the equation of the new curve? Okay, fine. So these are two um, transformations. They are transformations that you should know from uh, A-level uh, maths if you're doing A-level maths. So a stretch by a scale factor of a half parallel to the x-axis, this is usually written something like this. If you have a function f of x and you transform it into a function f of ax, so that's like Every time x appears in your function, you replace it by ax, and a can be any number. Then this is, is corresponding to a stretch parallel to the x-axis with a scale factor of 1 over a. So in our case, our scale factor is a half, so our a is 2. So what we first do is we first change y equals sine x to y equals sine 2x, so it's that transformation of changing x to 2x everywhere, okay? And then it is translated by pi over 4 in the negative x direction. So this is another one you should know, that when f of x is transformed to f of uh, x plus a, so this is like every time you have an x, you replace it with x plus a, this is actually translating it in the negative x direction by a units, okay? So that's what we have here. We're translating in the negative x direction by pi over four units. So that means that our sine 2x, it, it, always, it always acts on the x, not on the 2x. So this will be sine of 2x plus pi over four. So if you open out the, that bracket there, then you're going to get 2x plus pi over 2. Um, so that is option H here. 52. The graph shows how the horizontal force on a tennis ball of mass m varies during a shot in a tennis match. The ball is initially traveling horizontally towards the racket with speed u and leaves the racket horizontally traveling in the opposite direction with a speed v. Which expression gives the magnitude of the momentum of the ball as it leaves the racket? Okay, so this is an impulse here. So we're using uh, Newton's second law, which is force is the rate of change of momentum. So the way that I would write this is force um, equals change in momentum over change in time. So if we use force times change in time, the, or, or time of the force in contact with uh, the object, and that would be um, T2 minus T1 here, that's our delta T, is equal to change in momentum. Now, we know our change in momentum, though. We know that it comes into the racket with a speed U and leaves the racket with a speed V, um, but these two are in opposite directions. So um, if we take the momentums, the mass doesn't change that is going to be mv minus mu. That's your change in momentum. So if you equate these two, um, we're looking for which expression gives the magnitude of the momentum uh, of the ball as it leaves the racket. This is just mv. So this is going to be f times t2 minus t1 plus mu. So that is option c here. OK. The two, uh, the equations of two straight lines are this and this. Okay, p is a real constant. For certain values of p, the two lines are perpendicular. Which of the following numbers is closest to the greatest value of p? Okay, this is a little bit fishy because it's not giving me the exact answer. So I'm probably suspecting that my p is going to be a third or something that I can't can't calculate to any degree of accuracy really. So. If I'm looking for where these two lines are perpendicular, the gradients of the two lines, which are given by these sort of p expressions here, should 
if you multiply them together, equal negative 1. So another way of saying this is 2p squared minus p times p minus 2 is equal to negative 1. Okay, so I can sort of expand this, and that's going to give me another cubic. So this is one of those um, sort of strange cases where we're looking for all of the p values we're going to have to just sub in to find a p value and then we, we probably need to work out all three values if there are three values um, because we're actually looking for the greatest one so if I do this I'm going to get 2p cubed um, minus p squared uh, minus another 4p squared so it's going to be minus 5p squared and then I'll have a minus 2p, sorry, plus 2p, plus 2p, and then I will have a minus, sorry, a plus 1 on the end there. That's going to be equal to 0. Okay, just checking I've done that correctly. So it's that times that, those times those, and then that times that, and this one times this one. Yes, I think that's right. Okay, so let's try a few values. Let's try p is 1. So that would be 2 minus 5 plus 2 plus 1. Aha, that one worked. Okay, so that one does equal 0. So p equals 1 is a solution. So we're going to do exactly the same as what we did last time. We're going to try and find the quadratic, which is, um, which is sort of uh, a factor of this cubic here, when we know one of the solutions is p equals 1. So we know one of the factors is p minus 1. So doing this we can say that um, we're going to have an a plus p squared plus b p plus c in here and if I equate the the coefficients then I actually know that this time I have a 2p cubed so a has to be equal to 2 and on the end I'm going to have a plus 1 so my c is negative 1 now, to work out my BP, uh, let's actually equate the, the coefficients of the, of the P squared term this time, just to show that you can do it with either P squared or just the P term. So I know that I've got minus 5 is going to be equal to BP squared by multiplying BP and this P here. So that's going to be equal to BP squared. There's another way of doing it. I can also use the AP squared times negative 1. So that's going to be minus 2p squared, minus 2p squared. Okay, so my b is then going to be um, minus 3, so minus 3 minus 2 is equal to minus 5, so this is going to be minus 3. So my quadratic that I end up with is going to be 2p squared uh, minus 3p minus 1, okay, and I'm suspecting that maybe I can't um, find a whole number solution to this because it says sort of the closest such value, okay? So it's the closest, greatest such value. So I'm just going to use the uh, quadratic formula here to solve this. So um, I usually start from underneath the square root. So b squared is 9 minus 4 times 2 times minus 1. That's going to be plus 8. So I'm going to get a root 17. Mm, okay, root 17 plus or minus 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 3. So that's 3 plus or minus root 17 over 2. Okay, now root 17 is nice because it's quite close to root 16, which is just 4. So I'm going to pretend that it is root 16 just to get some rough values. So this is approximately equal to 3 plus or minus 4 over 2. So the, the higher of those two values is approximately equal to 7 over 2, which is 3.5. Um, do I have that one there? No, I don't. Uh, 7 over 2 is 3.5. What's gone wrong here? Oh, sorry, it should be 2a on the bottom. My god, that was close. Um, so it's not 2 on the bottom, it's 2 times 2. Okay, so it should be a 4 on the bottom here. Sorry about that. Um, so doing that again now, this time, it should be 
um, 1 plus 3 over 4, which is 1.75, which is a solution. So the answer is B. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I should have should revise my quadratic formula. It's over 2A on the bottom there. Okay. Right. I think this is the final question. So let's have a go at this. Question 54. The acceleration versus time graph um, is for a ball dropped from rest, falling vertically and bouncing on the ground. Okay. So you can see the acceleration is negative 10 almost consistently, and every time it hits the ground, it has this kind of spike in acceleration where it bounces up again. Um, the time of contact in the ground can be ignored. What is the speed of the ball immediately after hitting the ground for the first time, and what is the maximum height reached by the ball after the first bounce? Okay, so you can see that the acceleration, actually, the peak in acceleration goes down. Um, so this kind of signals to me that you're losing energy, your your sort of um, your force of contact on your second bounce is less than your force of contact on your first bounce. So this must mean that you are losing energy here. This is not an idealized situation. So it asks, what is the speed of the ball immediately after hitting uh, the ground for the first time? And what is the maximum height reached by the ball after the first bounce? So what we can do is we can say this acceleration times time here will give us our speed when we hit the ground. Okay, so we're working out this velocity that we hit the ground with. Now, if we conserve momentum, then the velocity that we bounce off the ground with should be um, uh, should should be sort of the um, should be sort of somewhat the same. Um, but I think that we should be losing energy here. So what is the speed of the ball immediately after hitting the ground for the first time? What is the maximum height reached by the ball after the first bounce? So actually, what we can work out, yeah, what we can work out here is if we look at this acceleration times time here, then we can work out um, the velocity of the ball because it will have to slow down back to its original value. Okay, so this is a complicated question. So what is the speed of the ball immediately after hitting the ground for the first time and what is the maximum height reached by the ball after the first bounce? Okay, so if you do acceleration times time on the time interval between the two bounces, you get, um, what is that, 0 0.8 seconds times minus 10, um, minus 10 meters per second uh, squared. So that will give you a minus 8 meters per second for your change in velocity. Okay, so this means that when I bounce back up again, I must be at 4 meters per second, because what's going to happen is I'm in the air all of this time, and I have to hit the ground again with another four meters per second, but in the other direction. So that's a total change in velocity of minus eight meters per second. Okay. Now, if I'm trying to work out my maximum height, um, does it tell me my height? No. So I can do that. Um, the maximum height after the first bounce. So what I can do is I can say that um, if I have a u of 4, an a of negative 10, and a v of minus 4, I'm just looking for s. Uh, my displacement, oh no, my displacement would be 0, wouldn't it? But let's say, um, let's work out, uh, what we could do is we could work out the time and then half it, um, just a second. Mm -hmm. So let's say that, let's use a v of zero, and then I can say I'm at the top, okay? So I'm looking for s when my v is zero. So if I use v squared equals u squared minus 2as, then I can solve this. So it's going to be minus 16 for minus u squared um, is equal to 2 times minus 10 times s, so 2 times minus 10 is minus 20 times s. If I divide by minus 20, 
I get um, 0 0.8. Okay, so my height is 0 0.8. So the answer is A here. Um, you reach a height of 0 0.8 meters after the first bounce. Okay, that seems to work out fine. Um, I think if you work out this acceleration times time for the period between time equals zero and, and the sort of first bounce, you can see that that is um, a total of 0 0.5 seconds. And the second one was like 0 0.8 seconds. So you can see it's kind of losing um, time each time. So that, that makes sense. I think it's going to be dropped um, from higher than this, this 0 0.8 meters. And it seems to have this kind of uh, that sort of five, 0 0.5 seconds there, and, and the sort of half time to the top is 0 0.4 seconds here. So you can see it's losing energy each time. I think you probably dropped it from one meter. Um, and, and that's how you could work out more of this question. Yeah, tough last question. Interesting paper. Um, I've, I hope you've enjoyed this solution and that it's been very helpful. Thanks.